right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, taking the opportunity to listen to my research presentation. My name is Greg Shulchewski. And as you can see from the title of this first uh, slide, is that I'm going to be telling you about surface active nanomaterials and thin films. So I thought I would first just give a general overview of the type of work that my group has been doing in the last decade or so. So if you can start uh, by drawing your attention to the bottom left-hand part, you'll notice um, we've made these uh, photocatalysts out of uh, titanium dioxide. So these are nanoparticles that are intended to uh, catalyze uh, reactions on the surface. So obviously we want a nano-sized material to have a high surface area. And so titanium dioxide is a known uh, photocatalyst, except it absorbs ultraviolet light. So we uh, chemically made these with nitrogen doping, which lowers the band gap, which allows them to absorb visible light. And then through some chemical treatment and heat treatment, we're able to crystallize the material, which removes defects, and uh, replace um, hydroxyl groups with fluoride, which allows us to uh, increase the photoactivity of this material. So that's just one project where we've used surface chemistry to make a active nanomaterial. Uh, we've also worked in the area of molecular or organic spintronics. So the idea here is to use organic semiconductors uh, in device applications. So we've made things known as organic spin valves, which are sensitive to external magnetic fields. And we've also studied this phenomenon known as spin crossover. So spin crossover uh, is an example where uh, a a transition metal complex will undergo a spin change um, as a function of temperature. So you can see, in fact, for this uh, iron phenanthylene-based uh, compound that right, it's thermochromic, so it's, it's um, changing its color with temperature, but it also changes its spin state, which means that it can be sensitive to the presence of a uh, external magnetic field. So um, Again, we've made thin films of these known bulk materials for those applications. And then if we draw our attention over to the right-hand side of this slide, uh, we've made recently thermoelectric materials. So um, very interesting class of materials. Thermoelectrics are materials that can convert heat into electricity. So I'm showing you here in this top example where uh, we've recently published We've chemically synthesized silver telluride nanowires, uh, made composites in this uh, n-type conducting polymer, and we've um, measured the spontaneous voltage that develops over this temperature gradient, and that's called the Seebeck coefficient. So the sign of this coefficient is negative, which tells us that there are electrons that are moving. So um, this is just a, a, a photograph of a real device architecture to show you you know, how we actually make these kind of devices and make these measurements. But what I'm going to tell you about in the next 10 minutes is the work that we've done on metal organic frameworks because this is the, um, the project that we are most heavily focused on in my group right now. So if you're not familiar with the metal organic framework, uh, that stands for a MOF. It's essentially a type of three-dimensional coordination polymer where we have um, alternating inorganic ions and organic linkers. So if we take a look at this Tinker Toy image, uh, it gives you a, a general idea of what a MOF really is. So these struts, if you will, represent an inorganic ion, and then the sticks represent a bifunctional organic um, molecule. So the idea would be, of course, this uh, repeats in three dimensions. So think of this as just the unit cell, and the reason we're using the Tinker Toy image uh, is to get you to uh, understand that there is a very large internal surface area. So um, the goal of this research is to be able to you know, modify. You can change the length of the linker. That changes the pore size. You can put functional groups that point into the pore. So you can control the properties, the chemical and physical properties of these materials. Now, that's ideally what you'd like to do. The truth is, is that these materials lack some um, properties for real practical applications. So because of the, the very high pore volume, sometimes they're not mechanically stable. They collapse. They're maybe thermally not stable. And in fact, they can be very sensitive to moisture. 
So this is the fruit fly of moths. It's known as UIO66. Uh, that's a photograph of an actual powder form of the material. But my group is going to um, work in thin films. And in fact, I'm going to tell you about a recent paper that we just published. So that's highlighted over here in the left, where we grew films of the UIO moth onto um, a quartz crystal microbalance to measure the ability of these um, porous materials to absorb this BTEX family of compounds. So BTEX stands for benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene isomers. So you might ask, why are we interested in these compounds? Well, they're very important starting materials uh, industrially, and in particular, the xylene compounds are, due to their very similar physical properties, very difficult to separate. It's a very energy intensive separation. It's about 50 gigawatts of power annually to separate these isomers, which is equivalent to about the energy required to power 40 million homes. The main point here I want you to realize is that the kinetic diameter of these molecules is on the order of five to seven angstroms. So the UIO moth, which I'm about to show you, has a pore that is sub about 11 uh, angstroms. So the UIO was well suited to sequester these molecules. So in the upper right hand uh, portion of the slide, you can see these orange spheres, which just represent the specific zirconium node that we're going to be using in the UIO family. You look at the blue and green sticks, they represent the ligands, which we've used these terthalate based ligands. And this is just to show you that there is an octahedral pore and also a tetrahedral, I should say, cavity with the approximate dimensions of, again, about 11 angstroms and 8 angstroms. So with the small hydrogen, you get the biggest pore size. And with the larger nitro functional group, the pore diameter reduces to about 6 or 7 angstroms. So we can control uh, the pore diameter just by using the functional group. But you can also imagine, right, this is going to change chemically, right? You have the possibility of hydrogen bonding with the amino get a very strong dipole with the nitro. So you can control physical and chemical properties by, again, tailoring the property of your, your linker. So again, our expertise lies in making thin films. And so what we're going to do is grow a thin film on a quartz crystal microbalance. So if you're not familiar with these uh, QCMs, is that they are a very sensitive mass balance. So the clean crystal oscillates at about 6 megahertz. And the electronics that we have can detect a subhertz change in the frequency. And you can see that a one hertz shift in the frequency corresponds to about 25 nanograms. It's a very sensitive mass balance. So how do we make these films on these crystals? So we put the crystal in just a, um, a reaction jar. We're going to take a micropipette and put the zirconium precursor ion and the organic ligands right on top of the crystal. And then we use acidic DMF, which is the solvent. So we seal this, put it into an oven. We bake it for about three hours at 120 degrees C. And then the hot vapor actually is what initiates the reaction just in this droplet on top of the substrate. So uh, when we evaporate uh, the, the DMF, we're left with a thin film. So this is just to show you. Um, a very quick overview of the kind of techniques that we need to do to look at thin film. So uh, we have to have very specialized um, surface sensitive and surface selective um, techniques. So we do a lot of electron microscopy. You'll notice from this SEM cross-sectional image that from the scale bar, our film is about one to two microns. So there's not much material. Uh, we do X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to look at atomic composition thin film x-ray diffraction to look at the orientation of the films, and infrared and Raman spectroscopy to confirm um, the functional groups that we expect to be in there. So point is, we, we have to do um, some non-conventional um, analysis techniques to, to, to characterize these materials. This is the quick summary of the results of looking at the adsorption capacity of the BTEX family on these three different MOFs. So if you look at the, the red bars here, that's for the hydrogen um, terminated or the hydrogen uh, functional group. Uh, the blue um, columns are for the amino 
UAO um, moth, and the yellow is for the nitro. So you can see as you move from left to right, we go from benzene to toluene, right? That's one methyl group, ethyl benzene, and then the xylene isomers. You can see the general trend here is that the, the bigger the molecule, the, um, the larger the adsorption capacity, which is reflected in what's called the Henry's constant. This is just an equilibrium constant. Um, we don't need to worry about the units. But the take home message basically, as you can see, is that for the um, nitro bearing ligand, we have a smaller pore and the Henry's constants are the largest. For the hydrogen bearing moth, we see very low Henry's constants because now the, the molecules are actually um, not hysterically held inside these cavities. So what we are currently doing with these uh, thin films is using them as a host to synthesize nanocatalysts. So this is just going to be a very quick uh, overview of the proof of concept that we have now developed. So we have our thin film. This is just to represent the, the nanopore. Uh, the idea here is that we want to um, intercalate silver ions into these pores. So we just dip this into a solution of silver nitrate. We then, after loading the pores with the ions, we uh, rinse this off, put this in a methanol solution, which serves as a sacrificial reducing agent. And using UV light, we basically can transfer an electron from the methanol, the silver ions, we can reduce them to make silver nanoparticles. So we need to sort of now characterize these sub nanometer pores, and we're gonna use atom probe tomography to do that. So if you look down here at the bottom and see these three SEM images, it shows you how we take this continuous planar film and convert it into this sub 50 nanometer tip. So if you look down here at the scale bar, this is a 500 nanometer scale bar. We lose the resolution as we look in the SEM, but we started out with our thin film that we use what's called a focused ion beam to make this wedge. You can see there's a tiny little bit that's left remaining. We essentially pluck this off with a very sharp metal tip. We put it onto a silicon post. And what's not shown here is that there's this circular disc with a hole in it. And we shoot argon ions through there to essentially fashion this into a, into a tip. So when we have this needle, essentially, this atomic needle, we're going to put it inside the atom probe. And so the atom probe is really a time of flight mass spectrometer okay with a two-dimensional detector so let's just quickly walk through this so here's our sample tip which is again maybe a hundred nanometers or smaller in radius it's cooled down to cryogenic temperatures we used a pulse laser to actually ionize the material so the ions enter the time of flight mass spectrometer which allows us to determine the mass to charge ratio and because we're using a two-dimensional detector uh, we can then reconstruct, depending on where the ions hit the detector, where they had to originate. So the idea here is by taking multiple laser pulses, we generate mass spectra, which allows us to determine the XYZ position of these, um, of these ions. So this is raw data. You need to understand that each one of these little green dots is actually a silver ion, which of course started as an atom inside the tip. You can see when we blow up the high mass end of the mass spectrum that there's the silver 107 and 105 isotopes. So this clearly demonstrates that our proof of photoreduction to make these nano catalysts inside the pores work. So we are going to now use this protocol to make a highly active sub nanometer hydrogenation catalyst. So to quickly summarize then, uh, hopefully you see that my research is very interdisciplinary. Um, typically students that join my group are interested in either analytical, physical, inorganic. So we're clearly focused on making these surface active materials for the energy applications like harvesting and thermoelectrics, like trying to optimize uh, separations for energy savings. And of course now we're interested in using these as um, little reactors for the preparation of nano catalysts. And this is just a snapshot of some of the recent students that have uh, worked in my group and uh, some of the companies that they work at. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to uh, talking to you if you are interested in learning more details.